Hello, welcome to Eco 595 Applied Business Research. In this lecture, we're going to go over Chapter 9, Survey Research and Overview. So survey is actually commonly used for business research. Um, survey can be quick, inexpensive, and efficient. Okay. Um, first of all, I hope you all know what respondents means, right? Uh, just the people who basically answer the survey, they're called respondents. And um, when we say survey, we do have a term called sample survey. Um, this means when we are interested in a big group of people, we may not survey everybody in that group. Instead, we may select a representative sample and survey the sample then that's called sample survey. So it's basically the same thing as conducting survey, uh, because even though you survey the whole population, you do not get response from everybody there. So eventually what you collect is just a sample of the population. Um, but if the population is huge, you cannot sample everybody there, then you do select a smaller group, which is called a sample, and survey this smaller group. And as I mentioned, survey can be quick because it depends on how you conduct the survey. You design it. If you do it in person, then you can get the answer right away after the, fin the person finishes the survey. Or if you do it mail, it's still faster. It's still, it is still quick in the sense that you do get your results within a few weeks or a couple of months. It is inexpensive in the sense that, um, again, it depends on how you conduct it. Electronic survey, meaning you conduct survey online or you use emails, that's almost cost nothing except for the time you spend on designing the survey and send it out. Um, it is efficient in the sense that you can have data collected quickly and with less cost. But survey, it depends on how you conduct it. So if you conduct it very in a good way, it's effective. However, there are a lot of situations where people may make mistakes in conducting service. Some of them mistakes can be avoided, some of them cannot. And the first one is called random sampling error. Okay. Um, this happens when you select respondents, but they are not selected randomly. And that means you have a higher chance of select uh, a certain group of people, then the data you get are biased in sense it does not represent the whole population, population very well. And a given example here is the 1969 Vietnam draft lottery. If you are interested, just Google that, um, take a look at it. It's, I think it's kind of interesting example showing you how random sampling error can occur in survey, although in that case, it's not about the survey, it's about selecting people. But the same similar idea, if the probability of each person being selected is not the same, then you have a biased sample. It's just like lottery drawing, right? The typical for a company, um, usually by the end of the year, there's a party and uh, some companies will give out prizes. And you just, I think, how it works is you write the name on a piece of paper and that piece of paper is put in a big box. It's randomly drawn from the big box. Um, so that's random sampling. Um, however, if when this drawing is happening, that the person who draw the winner only draw from the, the upper level of the box, then there's a bias because people who put their name into the box at the beginning will have a lower chance of being selected. So that's called sample bias. With this page, I guess I just want to show you there are tons of situations that you can make a mistake when conducting service. Um, I do not intend to go over these errors in details. Um, actually, I do plan to spend just a short time on this chapter. Um, I guess with this, what I want to say is when you conduct survey, okay, uh, if you have to conduct a survey yourself to because of your budget constraint, 
be careful, learn more about the art of conducting surveys because it's not simply as you go ask, go out and ask people questions. It's not simple like that. Um, on the other hand, the bottom line is if you can afford it, try to use some expert, try to hire an expert to conduct the survey for you because look at all these biases and errors. Um, there are a lot of things to pay attention when conduct the surveys. So here, instead of going through that whole list, let me highlight a few bias that are easy that are easy to understand and that are very common. These are all related to sample bias. So the first one is no contact. That means there are people that you just not just cannot contact or they are inaccessible. Uh, for example, if you're conducting phone interviews, right? Um, nowadays, with color ID and every and um, telemarketing going on, um, a lot of people are not answering every telephone. Um, at least I don't do that. I only answer phone calls that I know, and or if I'm expecting someone uh, to call me, then I will probably answer phone calls from that area. Otherwise, I don't take phone calls. So in that sense, if um, a company is conducting survey using telephone, I will be the no contact for them. Um, so then in this case, there will be sample bias. And refusal, same thing when people are not willing to participate in a research project or in a survey, right? Even if I pick up the phone call, if it's about the survey and I'm in a rush, I will just simply refuse to do so because this is voluntary, they cannot force me to do that. There's also self-selection bias, which occurs that when people select the service they want to respond or select the questions they want to respond based on their feeling, right? For example, for me, um, I, I do I have to say I do select certain service that I want to answer if they are I think more critical, I'll answer the service, even though there's no uh, reward or whatsoever. But if there are less general service that I don't think is very important um, and I don't have time, then I will just skip it. So that's called self-selection bias. And this happens all the time. Okay. So bias sample can result in something inaccurate. This is an example shown here overestimating patient satisfaction. So on, on satisfaction surveys, do responses, responses represent a cross-section of customers? Um, researchers studied patient satisfaction surveys found that more satisfied patients were more likely to complete and return the survey. So that means this is a biased sample because there's self-selection here. People who are more satisfied are more likely to complete the survey. And this will result in overestimate satisfaction. From the survey, the result may show that, oh, there's a high satisfaction rate for this particular cap, uh, hospital. However, because of the bias sample, that information is misleading. And if you think about the reason, to me, I think one potential reason is if you think about the survey, right? Um, suppose I'm a customer of the hospital and after I'm discharged, I usually re receive a, a long survey. Um, suppose I'm extremely unsatisfied, okay? And the way I, I will solve the problem pro will not be answering the survey. Instead, I will file a complaint. I will talk to the managers, etc. I'll take other ways to um, find a solution for my dissatisfaction. Um, answering a survey saying indicating I'm not satisfied, honestly, will help the hospital improve their services, but will not help quite a lot in regards to what happened to myself. On the other hand, if I'm very satisfied, then you know I feel better. I just you know recovered from something, and I'm in good mood. I would, of course, be happy to answer a survey and give positive feedback. In particular, if I have someone that is super good, I would definitely have to have more incentive to complete a survey just to let hospital, the management know that 
uh, their employees are very good. So this is sample of by sample, right? And there's in terms of responses, even if people answer surveys, there's also response bias, meaning that people sometimes will give false answers or they will um, modify the answer quite a little bit for a few reasons. One is to conceal personal information or avoid embarrassment, especially if the questions are kind of sensitive. And there's also one hypothesis or actually kind of theory called average person hypothesis saying that most individuals prefer to be viewed as average. So sometimes when people answering surveys, they will kind of modify the responses to make themselves appear to be more average instead of the extremes. Um, I guess this is, has something to do with us wanting to be um, taken at a normal part of the society. Um, that's my view. Of course, there are individuals that just want to be unique, but the majority of us do have this do follow this hypothesis that we that is we want to be an average person. There's also more response bias, unconscious misrepresentation. You know, sometimes the survey questions are just not clear enough. After all, the survey questions are designed by someone, right? And the, per, the person who designed the survey may not design the best question, so the question can be misleading, and the respondents would not be able to give the right answer. Or sometimes we just cannot recall the details. It's a long time ago, right? We, I just can't recall everything there. There are a lot of situations um, that will make people to give incorrect answer unconsciously. That means they, they try their best, but they just cannot give the very accurate answer there. More biases, let's, let's skip these as I mentioned. I just want to show you the biases and we're gonna talk about a few that are uh, quite common. Now in terms of um, surveys, there are two types of study. One is called cross-sectional study. Um, and for this, we call the data collected according to such studies are called cross-sectional data. That means we collect data on various subjects at a single moment of time. Okay, if I survey uh, a class, if I survey my class today, that's a cross-sectional study because I only study at one single moment and I study everybody in my class. Okay, that's cross-sectional. Now the other type is um, across time and across individuals. Longitudinal study. Uh, I always have a hard time pronouncing this word. Um, but anyway, uh, usually this will result in a panel data in the sense that we track individuals on time. Now if I survey my class every week, every week when we meet, that's panel data that is also considered as longitudinal study and such study can be useful when we want to kind of capture some trend in this group of respondents. Um, there's a very useful, at least in social science and sometimes business, it's called National Longitudinal Surveys by Bureau of Liquor Statistics. They actually um, track the same group of people over years and they ask almost about everything in their life um, of these individuals about their attitudes, behavior, purchase habits over time. And I actually used to assign this database to my students when I teach the stack course, ask them to write project using the database. And um, the database even asks about drug users. So um, it's kind of very comprehensive data. I guess it. Uh, this is the last page, but um, it's just an example showing you the um, there's a Harris poll over time, uh, starting from 1990 to 2005, um, with different survey questions. Um, but that's all about chapter nine. So the bottom line for chapter nine is for you to understand that when conducting surveys, the advantage will be quick, expensive, efficient. 
but then there's tons of server errors that can occur. And it's also important that you understand the most common ones. For example, we could have a random sampling error, which results in sample bias. And um, in terms of respondent error, we could have non-respondent error, self-selection bias. We could also, in terms of responses, we could have people deliberately give false answers uh, due to the following reasons and also give false answers unconsciously due to few reasons. Okay. And finally, you understand what cross-sectional and longitudinal study means. So that's all about chapter 9. Um, I'll see you next time.